APCO Educational Topic Number 27, Postpartum Hemorrhage. Hello, I am Dr. P.P. Hemmings, and I will be your guide for our journey today into the land of postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is an obstetrical emergency. It is a major, often preventable cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. It is one of the top three causes of maternal mortality in both high- and low-income countries. The absolute risk of death from postpartum hemorrhage approaches 1 in 100 in low-income countries. It is estimated that there is one maternal death every four minutes secondary to postpartum hemorrhage. The objectives of this video are to list the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage, construct a differential diagnosis for immediate and delayed postpartum hemorrhage, and finally develop an evaluation and management plan for the patient with postpartum hemorrhage, including consideration of various resource settings. Let's start with some basic definitions. Postpartum hemorrhage is generally defined as blood loss greater than 500 cc's after a vaginal delivery or greater than 1,000 cc's following a cesarean delivery. Primary postpartum hemorrhage occurs within the first 24 hours after delivery and is caused by uterine atinine in 80% of cases. Other causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage include retained placenta, especially placenta accreta, defects in coagulation, uterine inversion, and lacerations. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage occurs between 24 hours and 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. Causes include retained products of conception, infection, inherited coagulation defects, and subinvolution of the placental site. Let's begin by discussing risk factors for uterine atony. Here is our uterus and the baby has just delivered. Ideally, the uterus will clamp down and you will feel good tone, which feels like a rock of hard muscle. When the uterus does not clamp down, we call this uterine atony. What can cause atony? Anything that over distends the uterus, so polyhydramnios or multiple gestations. If a patient develops chorioamnionitis during labor, then the muscle will not work as well, symbolized here by the little green bacteria. If she had a prolonged labor and or an augmented labor with oxytocin, so here is her arm with the IV that has oxytocin running into it for a prolonged time. On the opposite extreme, if she had a fast labor, then the uterus can sometimes react by acting surprised that it's already all done and does not clamp down. Lastly, a history of a postpartum hemorrhage or Asian or Hispanic ethnicity are also risk factors. Are there actions that we can take to try to prevent uterine atony? Active management of the third stage of labor, which is the time between the delivery of the fetus and the placenta, can reduce the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. Active management includes fundal massage, gentle cord traction, and IV or IM oxytocin. Let's move now to evaluation and management. We've discussed risk factors in preparation, but it's important to note that postpartum hemorrhage can often occur without any warning as well. General measures upon recognizing excessive blood loss include assessing the patient's overall status, including vital signs. Make sure that you have adequate nursing and physician support and think right away about adequacy of IV access and blood availability. Start the evaluation with a bimanual examination. If there is uterine atony, the uterus will feel boggy and soft. At the time of bimanual exam, you can assess for retained placental fragments and you can assess the uterine wall for rupture. A careful inspection should also be performed of the perineum, vulva, vagina, and cervix. The next step will be the targeted intervention depending on the etiology. We will start by discussing the management of uterine atony in more detail. Here is the big boggy atonic uterus. We will start by draining the bladder. It's difficult for a uterus to clamp down if there's a full bladder. Next, we'll move on to medical management. There are multiple uterotonic medications that can be used individually or combined to contract the uterus. Methyl ergonovine malleate, trade name methergen, is a potent uterotonic and is given intramuscularly. This should not be given to women with hypertension. 15 methyl prostaglandin F2 alpha, trade name hemabate, also stimulates the myometrial muscles to contract and is given intramuscularly. It should not be given to women with asthma, for it can theoretically constrict the bronchioles. Oxytocin should also be given intravenously, and mesoprostol can be administered buccally or rectally. In cases where medical management is not sufficient for hemostasis, the next step is uterine tamponade. This is achieved by uterine packing or by inflating a Bakri balloon within the uterine cavity. Both of these methods work by applying pressure internally to staunch the flow of blood. If these measures do not improve the bleeding, then the next step will be surgical management. One of the first steps can be a B lynch suture. A stitch is placed on the anterior surface of the uterus and then travels posteriorly. On the posterior aspect of the uterus, a stitch is placed, and then the suture travels anteriorly, and the suture is tied. This manually compresses the uterus. 
In addition, a uterine artery ligation can be performed for the uterine arteries insert here on the uterus at the level of the internal os. Inter interventional radiology can also be used to assist with uterine artery embolization. The patient has to be stable, however, in order to be able to transport her to the interventional radiology location. If all of these measures fail, hysterectomy is the definitive step in managing postpartum hemorrhage. It is important to note some key concepts here about blood replacement therapy. When a patient is experiencing a severe postpartum hemorrhage, the idea now is to intervene earlier to prevent coagulopathy such as DIC from developing. Packed red blood cells are the mainstay of blood replacement therapy. When there is a severe ongoing hemorrhage of four or more units of packed red blood cells needed over one hour or 10 or more units over 12 to 24 hours, the current recommendation is to transfuse in a one to one to one ratio, which is one unit of packed red blood cells to one unit of fresh frozen plasma to one unit of platelets. These interventions thus far have described options in high resource settings. What are the options for low resource settings? Remember that 99% of maternal deaths occur in developing countries, and postpartum hemorrhage accounts for one half of all postpartum maternal deaths. Active management of the third stage of labor is the gold standard recommendation at this time. The same three measures that we discussed earlier in this video, IV or IM oxytocin, gentle cord traction, and fundal massage. Oxytocin is the recommended uterotonic, however, it is not readily available in some settings with the highest risk for mortality and morbidity from postpartum hemorrhage. Current investigations are looking into whether mesoprostol could prove to be a viable substitute in settings where oxytocin is not available. This concludes the APGO video on postpartum hemorrhage. We have reviewed key concepts about etiologies, risk factors, and management for postpartum hemorrhage in low and high resource settings.